I hope you brought a Bible. We're going to be in John's Gospel today, chapter 14. Uh huh. See, you automatically return into the book of Revelation, huh? But we're in John 14 today. And we're going to read some familiar verses. But maybe they'll bring a message across that, uh, that I, I pray will speak to our hearts today. Some years ago, uh, I was pastoring in Araby, Louisiana. We had a, <clears throat> a little church on a street called Friscoville Avenue. And I was a young pastor. We were not far from a, a K&B drugstore. So, you know, this is a few years ago because <laughs> K&B, you know, if you're a non-native New Orleanian, you wonder what that is. But K&B was the old standard. Ain't there no more, Ain't there no more right? Well, well in, in those days, it was a real treat if I took my kids to the drugstore because they could buy, you know, a few little candies or whatever they wanted. That was, and that was a big thing when daddy was taking them to K and B. And we happened to be, uh, at the church a little early. So it was me and one of the girls. We decided we would walk over to K and B and I'd, I'd get them a few treats. Walked over to K and B, wasn't too far away, less than a block away. We had to cross a couple of streets. And on the way back, as we, we crossed the street, I saw a car pull up to the stop sign. We were walking back to the church. A car pulled up to the stop sign. I thought I recognized the car. I looked, and sure enough, there's a guy I went to high school with in the car, and he and I were the biggest clowns in, uh, in school. I wasn't known for being studious, and, uh, uh, but, but for being mischievous and being a, a real clown at, at school. Anyway, I see him sitting in the car. I haven't seen him in years. So... I went up to the passenger side as he stopped at the stop sign and just pressed my face up against the glass. You know. And you know how you can, you know, smash your face and do all of those things. So that's what I was doing on the passenger side, just making all of these faces and slamming on them and those. And, and I thought he'd get a kick out of it. And when I, when I stood back to look at him, I had no idea who that guy was in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and he slowly reached his hand over and locked the door. <laughs> and I remember standing up and he hurriedly drove away. So, a little humbled, you know, uh, Took my daughter by the hand and we walked on back to church. <laughs> and there's a moral to this story. I thought I knew him. But I didn't know him at all. I thought I recognized him. But it wasn't him. <laughs> you know, I want to talk that, uh, use that as a, just an example this morning because there's a lot of people who think they know Jesus they think they know him there's a lot of people who really think they're familiar with him and in particular this time of year but sadly many of them don't know him at all sadder still that some of the people who think they know him are people in church. They think they know him. They go through routines and rituals and rites. Maybe they grew up in a religious home. I grew up in a religious home. Many, many of us did. Maybe, maybe this so-called familiarity we, we thought we had, we thought we knew him. But you may find out too late, too late, that the one you thought was Jesus wasn't Jesus at all. Maybe, maybe, we have some imagined 
idea of who Jesus is. And you know, we Americans are good for that. The Jews had their own notion of who the Messiah would be. The Jews were looking for a Messiah who would be king, who would come and who would conquer the Romans and throw off this oppression, who would stop this taxation, restore the kingdom to Israel. The, the, the Jews were looking for a specific Messiah. And when Jesus didn't quite fit the bill, they rejected him. They weren't looking for the Jesus that came. They were looking for something else, some image they had in their mind. The Jewish notion, uh, uh, some notion of who Jesus was. I want to tell you today, there is an American notion of who Jesus is. There's an American notion and a, an American concept of who Jesus is that's really not the Jesus of the Bible at all. There's an American concept that Jesus... He's all about just making us happy. He's all about uh, blessing us. He's all about healing us. He's all about making me feel good about myself, building up my self-confidence and my self-esteem. He's all about serving me. And that's the Jesus that they're looking for. That's the Jesus we hear about so frequently. Unfortunately, the Jesus of the Bible isn't here to serve us, but for us to serve Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. All of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We ought to serve Him. And if you think that this American picture that many people have of Jesus who winks his eye at sin and pats us on the back and is going to bless us in spite of our rebellion, in spite of the fact that we shake our fist in His face and defy Him, and still He's going to answer our prayer and bless us and our life's going to be wonderful and happy, you've been duped. You don't know Him at all. You think you know Him. You just think you know Him. And many today think they know Jesus, but the fact is they don't know Him at all. In John 14, there's some passages that are familiar, and then there's some, this past couple of weeks, one of these verses in particular has just been jumping out at me until I preached on this passage. So today, I'm going to do it. In John 14, some familiar verses, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, John 14, 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. In fact, the same faith, expectation, praise, worship, adoration, love, affection that you would have toward God, we're to have toward Christ, who is God. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and pre prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. For where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you, you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. These verses, very familiar, very profound, uh, probably spoken just before the Lord's crucifixion. Most accounts have these uh, words of the Lord spoken the very night of the Last Supper. Verses 1 through 3 are some of the most familiar verses in the Bible. Because if you've ever been to a Christian funeral, 
they're usually going to read these verses. These verses are very, very comforting. Words of assurance, uh, words of promise when the Lord says, don't let your heart be troubled. That's a comforting message uh, at, at the death of a loved one, the death of a, a brother or a sister in the Lord. Powerful, very powerful and profound words. And uh, Christ says, he says here in verse 2, look, in my father's house are many mansions. The word mansions here is sometimes translated dwelling places, residence, house. Uh, it can be translated room. Mansion is where we get our uh, word manse and uh, a manor and so forth comes from that. But it means dwelling, abode, residence. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. The idea here, of course, is that there's a lot of room in my father's house. There's room for you here. There's room in the father's house for you. You know, you can always go home. The father's house is always welcoming, always inviting. And there's a place for you there, no matter how far you've wandered or how far you've strayed. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, verse 2, and if I go and prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again. Oh, he's coming again. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. These words are so comforting because the Bible assures us that there is a better place than here. And even though this is not a terrible place, not, not like many places in the world. But of course, if you're going through a terrible time, it doesn't matter how wonderful the place is. If you're going through a terrible time, it's a terrible place. Hello. But these verses assure us that there's a better place than this. There's a better life than this. There is life after death. Oh, there most definitely is life after death. And there is a place for us in the Father's house. There's a place for you, a place for me. Jesus said, in the Father's house. There's room for us all. Now, Jesus, in these passages, has been preparing his disciples for his own death. He's going to depart this world very soon. In fact, it wouldn't be long right after this. He would be breathing his last breath uh, on earth as uh, a man in flesh and blood. He knew that his death was at the door and he wanted his disciples to be ready for his departure. He didn't want them to be left uh, totally shocked. He, he didn't want them flabbergasted. He didn't want the rug pulled out from under their faith so that when he died, they're, they're in a place of uh, utter confusion and bewilderment. What do we do now? Oh no, the master's dead. Is this it? Is it all over? No, it's not all over. He's preparing them for his death. He wanted them to be comforted when he died because he wanted them to know, hey, look, I'll be back. Death is not the end. Death is not final. How do you know there's life after death? Nobody ever came back to, to tell us if there was or not. Wrong. Jesus came back to tell us. <laughs> he came back to tell us, oh, yeah, there's life after death. This is not all there is. This is preparatory for that. And this determines where you go when you die. So he's preparing them for his death. He lets them know, I'll, I'll come again. And, but he does need them to know at this point and this time that he was going to leave. He was going to die. You know, he came on a mission. God became flesh. Not so he could just walk around and sightsee, but he was on a mission. He came to live that sinless life, die that substitutionary death, rise from the grave, atone for you and me, make a way for us to heaven. And now it's time for him to complete this mission and, uh, and give himself as the final and ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. 
And he reminded them, you already know this. I've told you this before. He says in verse 4, Whether I go, you know, and the way you know. I've told you this before. I mean, you know where I'm going. You know how to get there. Uh, Williams translates verse 4. I like the way the Williams translate it. says, You know the way to the place where I'm going. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. But notice verse 5. Thomas actually contradicts the Lord here. He says, Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? We don't know where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, how do we know how to get there? We don't know. And this is one of the things I want to point out today. In fact, this will be one of three things I really want to drive home today. And uh, I pray that it will register in our hearts and minds. I, I want to make a point here. It was true then and it's true now. It was true amongst Christ's own disciples then. And I believe it's true amongst His own disciples today. And that is, number one, people often don't really listen. Now, isn't that profound? That's, what a pro People don't listen. Hearing they hear not, Isaiah said. Jesus quoted those very things. But it's like kids in school. And uh, our school teachers here could, uh, could testify. You know, it's like kids in school. They don't pay attention. They're there, but they're not there. Hello. I mean, they may be there bodily, but their mind's a thousand miles away. They're preoccupied. They're distracted. They're bored. They're half asleep. Uh, they're not concentrating. They're not focusing. Do you know the same thing could be said about Jesus' own disciples? They were there, but they weren't listening. Distracted. Preoccupied, minds racing way ahead, thinking of other things. They're worried. They're bored. They're not paying attention. They're not focused on what they should be. They're half the time just not interested. Why do I say that? Because look, look in verse two and three. Jesus just told them, "I'm going to my father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you." Right? Isn't that what he just told them? All right, so then we get to verse uh, 5. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. He just told them where he was going. Right? Where are you going? We don't know where you're going. I just told you where I'm going. I'm going to my father's house. I'm going to prepare a place for you. No, we don't know where you're going. Because they weren't listening. They weren't paying attention. I believe a lot of people don't listen even today. You know, a lot of heartache and tragedy, we could be preserved from a lot of heartache and tragedy if we'd listen. I read about terrible things in the paper all the time, or I see things on the news. Sometimes we see things in the lives of other people, terrible things, tragic things, all because somebody didn't listen. Think about how many children could be spared grief and heartache if they would only have listened to their mother, listened to their mother, listened to their father. Look before you cross the street. How many grieving parents? There'd be far fewer if their children would just listen. You, when you tell them those things, you don't tell them those things because you're mean. You don't tell them because you're some mean ogre. Don't play in the street. Or you just being mean. No. There's a reason why we tell you not to play in the street. We're trying to save you from a lot of heartache. How about the old advice, uh, never assume that that gun is not loaded. There's a whole lot of people who get killed every year from a, with an unloaded gun. Because they assume it's not loaded. No, it's not loaded. See? Of course, there's a thousand other things that we could use to illustrate. How many times do we hear, you never drive intoxicated? 
You never get behind the wheel of a car drunk. But this year alone, before this year rings out, 11,000 families are going to receive phone calls before the year's done. <clears throat> I'm not talking about from now till the end of the year, but over the course of the year. 11,000 families will receive phone calls that their loved one is dead and they were killed by a drunk driver. 11,000 times this year, a drunk driver will take somebody's life. It's all because somebody didn't listen. Hello. Somebody didn't listen. You know, if we'd listen, it could save us all a lot of tragedy and a lot of heartache. Uh, not listening can ruin your life. It's ruined a lot of lives. Simple advice. Don't have sex until you're married. People don't want to listen. And as a result, we're living in a society that's rampant with sexually transmitted diseases, un unplanned pregnancies. How about don't do drugs? How about don't hang with the wrong crowd? Uh, don't try to beat the train to the intersection. Or don't drop out of school. Or, you know, a thousand other things. Not listening, not listening can get you in a lot of trouble. And we live in a society where people don't want to listen. They don't want to listen to their parents. They don't want to listen to their teachers. They don't want to listen to authority. And you know why it is? Because we know better. We're Americans. We have the right to be stubborn and proud. <laughs> and so we are. We're a, it's, it's very true for us here in the United States. We're a stubborn, independent, proud people. We think we know better than everybody else. We're certainly smarter than our parents. By the time you reach 16, you realize your parents, they don't know anything. And you are so smart. <laughs> The older you get, the wiser you realize your parents were. Huh? But if this is true just in the natural and physical realm, not listening can get you in a world of trouble, then how much truer is it in the spiritual realm, not listening? It not only can wreck your life, it can wreck you for all eternity if you don't listen, if you don't listen. There's so many admonitions in the Bible for us to hear, Hear the word of the Lord. Hear what God has to say. I mean, even to the churches, the Lord repeated continually to the seven churches in Asia Minor. He said, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He repeats himself over and over and over. Why do you think he says that? Because people don't listen. That's why. Because hearing, they hear not. They hear it, but it doesn't register. It doesn't sink in. It doesn't make a change. Hearing, they hear not. I wonder if we're hearing. If we're hearing the word of the Lord. Are we really hearing the word of the Lord? Are we hearing his admonitions? Hearing his warnings? Hearing his commandments? Hearing his precepts, hearing the principles that he taught, all the things for our welfare, our benefit, our good, our salvation, our preservation, our blessing. All of those things are not in the word of God to keep us from having fun, but to preserve us from the evil. And there's plenty of that. Now, I wonder if we're hearing. Because we live in a world that doesn't hear. That's not new. Even back then, they weren't paying attention. Now, I want you to notice Thomas, his question, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus' response in verse 6 is one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. The way to what? To the Father's house. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternity. He's talking about everlasting life. If we don't know where you're going, how do we know the way? He said, I am the way. I'm the way. I am the way. I don't just know the way. I don't just point the way. I am the way. 
I am the truth. He doesn't, he doesn't just say the truth. Of course everything He said is true, but He is the truth embodied. I am the life. I am the life. I don't just point you to life. I am life. I am life itself. Real life. Eternal life. I am the way. Now, this verse stands as one of the most profound verses in all the Bible because to say this, no religious teacher on earth said this. No one would dare to. No Buddha or Mohammed or any other religious leader or religious founder would say such a thing because for, to say this, I am the way. There is a definite article there. In fact, every one of these has the definite article. I am the way, the truth, the life. In other words, there ain't any other way. There is no other way. He's not one way among many ways. Every other way is a false way. He says, I am the way. Now, now that's absolute exclusivity. It means every other religion is false. It means everyone who teaches anything opposite is a deceiver. I am the way. I am the way. Now, for Jesus to make a statement like that, I, 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 like, I really like what C.S. Lewis said. He said he'd either have to be a liar or a lunatic or he has to be Lord. <laughs> has to be one or the other. You can't just say, well, Jesus was a... Who was Jesus? Who, who is Jesus? Who is he? Well, if he's just a good man, like some people say, well, we believe he was a good man. He was a religious leader. He was a great teacher. He, he may have even been a prophet, but he wasn't God in the flesh. He was just, a, you know, a really good moral leader. You know, that's not an option. That's not an option because if he said, I am the way, and he was not the way, then he was a liar. If he said, I am the way, and he's not the way, and he's not a liar, then he has to be a lunatic. Or, we're left with one other option. He is the way. He said, I'm the way because he is the way. Do you mean, Brother Rusty, that nobody else is going to heaven unless they go through Jesus Christ? I didn't say it. I just read it. Jesus said it. And if it comes to me believing Jesus or Oprah, I choose Jesus. <laughs> who, who said on national TV, Jesus can't be the only way. But, but that's a story for another time. But given the choice, you know, who to believe, let me think. Uh, <laughs> I am the way. That means he's the only way. If you're going to be forgiven, it's going to be through Jesus. If you're going to be saved, it's going to be through Jesus. If you're going to get to heaven and have eternal life, it's going to be through Jesus. It's not going to be through you. It's not going to be because you're a nice person. It's not going to be because you're kind to animals and contribute to the March of Dimes. It's not going to be by your works or merits. God's not going to look at you and say, you know, you're a pretty nice guy. You seem to bathe regularly. and I think I'll just let you in. No, it's, we're going to go in. It's going to be one way. It's going to be through Christ. And, and the way you get in, you believe in God. He says, you've got to believe in me also. You believe in me. You put your faith and trust and confidence in me. That's the only way in. He's the way in. Take Jesus away, and then there is no way to heaven. Because you know why? God did not give us a plan B. There's one way. There is no other way. There is no plan B. He says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He says in verse 7, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. 
And from now on, from henceforth, you know Him. And you've seen Him. Had you known me like you should, is his point, you would have known the Father also. And from now on, you do know Him, he says in verse 7. And he says not only that, and you've seen Him. You've known Him, and you've seen Him. Now remember, the time of his ministry is winding up. Uh, now he's about to face a very cruel rejection, mockery, a mock trial. Uh, they'd beat him, they'd scourge him, they'd nail him to a cross. He would die, but he wouldn't stay dead. And, uh, and then he'd come back. He'd come back, he'd appear to his disciples again. And then he'd be uh, taken up to heaven, he'd ascend, and he'd send the Holy Spirit to abide with them forever. But on this night, right here, which most believe this is the Last Supper, at the end of the Last Supper, he gives them this, this whole discourse in John chapter 14. This night would change everything forever. It would be changed forever after this night. Philip, who you don't hear much of, Philip is one of the apostles, one of the twelve. You never hear much about Philip. He, he seemed like, uh, from what we do read, he was a very reserved uh, fellow, but, you know, a, a faithful, godly disciple of the Lord. Philip injects himself into this conversation that the Lord's been having with Thomas. And Philip says unto him, when he, when he heard those last words Jesus said, he says, Lord, show us the Father. Show us the Father. And that'll be enough. That, that'll suffice us. That's good enough. That's all we need. Show us the Father. And, and we'll be happy with that. Now, I want you to see Jesus' response. Because this is the passage that really leaps out. And uh, I want us to really make sure we get it. Jesus said unto him, and, and there's a note of disappointment in, in the Lord's voice. You can't help but see it there. It's, it's so clear. He says, verse 9, Philip, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me? Has it been this long and still you don't know me? Still you don't know who I am? Still you don't recognize me? He says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So how do you say then, show us the Father? <coughs> Excuse me. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. These are the Father's words. And the works that I do, these are the Father's works. Believe me, verse 11, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. You see, if, if He really is Lord, if He really is Lord, now Lord, God, there should be some evidence of it. There should be some evidence. If He is who He said He is, there should be some evidence. I mean, maybe some words that would transform people's lives. Maybe some of the most profound words ever spoken. Maybe there would even be signs or, or signals that would signify that he was more than a mere human. Maybe, maybe blind people would see or something. If he was really Lord, maybe crippled people would get up and walk. Maybe the paralyzed might even stand and run. Maybe, maybe he'd walk on water if, if he was really Lord. There should be some sign, some evidence. He said, and this is the part that leaps off the page. I hope it leaps out at you as well. His words to Philip. Now, now let this sink in. Philip, I've been with you this long, and still you don't know who I am. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? How can that be? 
you mean it's possible to follow along and not really know it? Now, in his defense, I believe Philip was a true believer in the Lord. I believe he knew the Lord as, as his Savior. But what we see here is that he should have known the Lord far better than he did. Far more than what he did. There should have been more recognition in Philip's eyes than what there actually was. And that brings me to the second point that I want to make today. Not only do people not hear, they don't see. They just don't see. They don't see what they should. And seeing, they don't see. Seeing, they don't recognize. Seeing, it doesn't register. Hello? Is it possible that Philip walked with the Lord all these years? Remember, now this is at the end of the Lord's life. After this night, the trial was on. And yet, this verse, these words from the Lord's own lips, Philip, you still don't see, you don't recognize me, you don't know who I am. The Lord had told this once before to the religious leaders. You know, he had told the Jews over in John chapter 8, he said, they don't know who I am. The religious leaders didn't know me. He said, if they'd known me, they'd known my father. But they don't know me or the father. He tells his own disciples here, you've been with me all this time and you don't even know who I am. You don't even recognize me. You'd have thought they'd have a greater knowledge than this. They had plenty of opportunity to know him. Here's my point, beloved. Right now, we have tremendous opportunity to really know the Lord. But oftentimes, our actions and our words reveal maybe we don't know Him like we should. I say this to the shame of the American church. I say this to the shame of American Christianity. There's a lot of people who say they know Him. But you can tell by what they do that maybe they don't know him like they think. Because if they did, they wouldn't act like that. If they did, they wouldn't talk that way. If they did know him like they should know him, they wouldn't behave the way they do. Hello. I wonder if the Lord might say the same thing today that he told his disciples then 2,000 years ago. That after all this time, you still don't know me? You don't know me like you should? Do you have your own preconceived ideas of what Jesus is or who Jesus is? Or, or do you know him? Do you really know him? Look, I, I have to throw this out because it just happens to be this time of the year. I wonder if the people who are singing all the Christmas carols, if they know the Jesus that they're singing about. You think they do? Now, maybe some of them do. You can't make a blanket statement about everybody. But there's a lot of people singing a lot of songs, and Jesus is actually in some of the songs. Some of these carols are actually old hymns, and some of them are profound. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Let heaven and angels sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. That's pretty profound. Isaac Watts. What about this? Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. <laughs> you know, some of these old hymns, of course, the carolers hijacked them. They, they think they're Christmas carols, but they have nothing to do with, with caroling. They, they're old hymns that set forth profound spiritual truths. One of my favorites was written by Charles Wesley. 
Hark the herald angels sing. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Do they know what they're singing? Do they see? Do they see? God and sinners reconciled. What does that mean to them? I don't know. <laughs> Presence, I guess. <laughs> Joyful, all you nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Listen to the second stanza. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. That's good theology. Charles Wesley wrote it. Well, you know... People sing of a Savior they don't know. They sing words that don't register. They don't see. Seeing they don't see. But I wonder if the same thing could be said of us. The sad thing is, they think they know Him. They think they know Him. Hello. But I ask you this, if they knew the Christ of the Bible, if they really knew Him, you think they'd celebrate His birth with drinking and drunkenness? Wait. Are y'all listening? They talk about Jesus. We're going to sing. It's like this is all about Jesus. And then they celebrate His birth with drinking and drunkenness and carousing. The most holy birth in all of human history, this is how we observe it, or this is how we celebrate it, with crudeness and lewdness, and the office parties where people who wouldn't drink any time of the year, they're going to drink, get drunk at the office parties. and They, they do wicked and crazy and foolish things. Uh, the office, the workplace, the home, and all the hell holes and joints and bars around the country. People are so full of the Christmas spirit that from now until after New Year, the police are setting up extra patrols to make sure we don't kill each other while we're drunk and driving down the road. Like I said, 11,000 people will get those midnight phone calls this year. We're sorry your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife was killed in an automobile accident by a drunk driver. 11,000 times that phone will ring this year. 11,000 times. And you know when most of them happen? holidays. This is when it happens between Christmas and New Year's. And look, they won't be ho 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 when that phone call comes. It'll be too late. All in celebration of the Jesus they think they know, they don't know him at all. They think he's look, he's such a, a, a precious baby Jesus. And I hear him referred to that way in, in many Many different ways. He's such a harmless, helpless little babe in a manger that is not threatening to anybody. But like Dave said, he grew up. He did come as a human being, as a child, God incarnate. And he grew into the lion of the tribe of Judah. And this, this lion, if you know him, if you know him, then you know he's not tame. You know he's not a petting zoo lion. You know he's not the circus lion that you train to jump through hoops. No, this is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he roars, men need to fall in fear. I don't believe that for the most part America knows this Jesus. They think they recognize him. They think they know who he is. And so they make monkey shines, like me standing in the door window of that guy, you know, making all my faces. And I, I thought I recognized that fellow, but I didn't know him at all. You know, some are going to find out too late, too late, 
that they didn't know Him at all. They didn't know Him at all. Matthew 7, 21. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord. Matthew 7. But before He says that, He says something very profound. And I want to I want to read this verse to you from Matthew 7 and verse 21. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Who's going to enter in? Those that do the will of my Father, that's in heaven. And that brings me to my third point today. I said, first of all, people don't listen. Second, they don't see. And the third thing I want to say is that they don't obey. You see, if we really heard what Jesus said, if we really saw who Jesus is, then we would obey the Jesus of the Bible. We would obey Him. He says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. These are some of the most somber words that Jesus ever said. Because you can call Him Lord. You can say, I know Him. Look, we've done many wonderful things in Your name. We've cast out devils. We've gone on, uh, we've gone to church. We've carried a Bible. We've prayed prayers. We've gone on missionary crusades. But He said, it's those who do the will of My Father that will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And everybody else, He says, depart from Me. You who practice wrongdoing. Those of you who practice iniquity. Those of you who reject my call to obedience and submission. You doers of wickedness, depart from me. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Do you love him? Do you just say you love him? If you love him, he says, we keep his commandments. Uh, I don't know if this jives with the, the American view of Jesus that people uh, make up in their minds. Because the, the American version of Jesus doesn't ask much of us. He doesn't require anything, really. Uh, certainly, He doesn't require a cross, that we take up a cross. Certainly, He doesn't require any holiness on our part. He doesn't require any sacrifice, any abandoning of sin or self. You see, the Jesus that we're comfortable with is a Jesus who pretty much lets us live our lives the way we want. I want to do certain things, I'll do them, and Jesus bless me. And if things don't go right in our life, then we blame Him for not blessing us. And that's, that's Americans. That's the way we do it. We think everybody ought to cater to us, including God. And God should make us happy, and He should make us comfortable, and we'll be certain to let Him know if He fails. We've got lots of complaints, and we're just not going to believe in Him no more. The Jesus of the Bible calls us to seek first His kingdom and to seek first His righteousness. How about that? Is that the Jesus that we know? Is that the Jesus who makes us comfortable? Look, in John thirteen thirteen. since you're right there in John, look with me to chapter 13. You all awake still? Yeah. All right. Good. Let me keep you just a few minutes longer. John 13. Notice what Jesus says here. You call me Master and Lord. You say, well, for so I am. Now, he's talking to them about washing feet and, and how that we should serve one another and humble ourselves and so on. But I really like verse 13 when he says, you call me Master and Lord. And when you do, you say right, because that's who I am. I'm Master and Lord. Now, here's my question. Is he really our Master and Lord? Is he our Master and Lord? Really and truly, do you just think that he is because you have some dubious faith in Him. You say, yeah, I believe in Him. You know, I call Him Lord and, and I pray and I, I occasionally read my Bible and I might show up at church even once in a while. I mean, I'm a real believer. Uh, but is He your Master, Master and Lord? 
Is He your Master and Lord? You see, if you're not really submitted to His will for your life, then He's not your Master. And He's not your Lord. If you are going about life doing your own thing, then you are Master and Lord of your life. And He's not your Lord at all. Hello? If we reject His authority over us, no matter how many Christmas carols you sing, He's not your Lord and He's not your Master. I, I want to remind us that this is the Christ who flung the stars into space, who set them in their rotations, uh, all the planets rotating around the sun. This is the Christ who did that. He told the earth right where to go in its rotation. That far, no further. He's the one who laid out the, the whole planet he told the mountains where they could go. He told the seas how far they could go and no further. He speaks and all of nature obeys Him. Whatever He says, all of nature obeys whatever He says except us. When it comes to us, He says, be holy. And we say, no, I don't want to. Hello. The winds and the seas obey Him. He says, seas, lay down. Winds, stop blowing. It obeys Him. He tells us, you, be moral. We say, I don't want to. You, be honest. We say, it's more fun being dishonest. You know, of all of creation, mankind is the only the only, only thing that dares to disobey the Master and the Lord. Only mankind dares to define. And yet, we do it in our actions. We do it in our words. He says one thing, we choose another. And yet, somehow, we think He's our Lord. Somehow, we think we're His. We know Him. We know Him. We know Him. When we continually deny Him and defy Him, and yet we think He's obligated to bless us. Bless me, Lord. What about Master and Lord? Is He Master and Lord? When He calls us to serve Him, when He calls us to serve Him, do we say no? We like it better, Lord, when you serve us. Or we'll live to serve ourselves. You know, when we refuse Him, when we reject Him, when we deny Him, we make God our enemy. Well, my question today is, do you know Him? Do you know Him? Do you really know Him? Do you think you know Him? Do you just think you know Him? Some people are going to find out too late when He says, depart from me. I, I don't know who you are. It'll be too late for them. And I do believe that there will be many. Jesus said there will be many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, I knew you. And He said, no, you didn't know me and I don't know you. I don't know you at all. It'll be too late then. It'll be way too late. Do we know Him? Now you see, if you know Him, if you really know Him, then that is translated into your lifestyle. He said in 1 John 2 and verse 3, listen to this, 1 John 2 and verse 3, here is how we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Here's how we know that we know Him. We obey Him. Are we obeying Him? Or are we defying Him? You see, you can't be His while you're denying His Lordship and His mastery over you. You're not His. You're deceiving yourself. 
Here's how we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. And then in John 14, since you're right here, I'm going to close with one more verse. Verse 21, I want you to read this one with me. John 14, 21, He that has my commandments and keepeth them, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself unto him. He says in verse 23, if a man loves me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. And then he says in verse 24, He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And once again, he says, I want you to know that the words I speak are my Father's words. So, if you don't love me, you can tell also. If you love him, you can tell. If you don't love him, you can tell. Those that love me not, they don't obey me. Those that do love me, they obey me. So, our question is, do you love him? Do you know him? Are you serving him? Is he master and Lord of your life? I mean, is he really master and Lord? Do you submit your life to him? Do you pray about decisions and choices? Do you... Do you commit that those things to Him? Do you Have you surrendered completely your life to Him so that you want to do His will and His will alone? The most important thing to you is having God's approval. Is that the most important thing? Having the Master's approval. You see, if it's not, then maybe you don't know Him as well as you think. Philip found out that he didn't know the Lord as good as he thought. Jesus said, all this time, still you don't know me. Is it possible maybe we don't know Him as good as we, we think? That we, we think we're further along than we are. We're, we're really Christians. I know I'm really a Christian. Well, have you really put your life in His hands? All of your life. You're not worried about anything else or anybody else. You don't worry about what society thinks. You don't even worry about what your family thinks when it comes to your complete submission to Christ. Christ first, foremost, and overall. I live to serve Him and to please Him. And if that makes everybody in the world upset, then so be it. Jesus said nothing less is discipleship. You've got to be willing to hate mother, father, sister, brother, your own life also. And if you're not willing to do that, He said, you can't be my disciple. Do you know Him? Well, Father, we bow our heads before you today and we ask that you would tug at each of our hearts Lord that you would reveal to us our shortcomings our weaknesses our failures our sins our rebellion Lord our desire is to know you as we should to know you really know you personally, to know you, Lord. Not just to know about you, but to know you. Lord, and to have that knowledge translated into real faith in you and dependence on you. Lord, I pray that you'd touch every life, every heart, every mind here today in, in the sound of my voice. Lord, let, let our overall desire be to please you with our lives. Let that be our life's goal, to please you, Lord. Not to please ourselves, but to please you. Father, forgive us, wash us, cleanse us, change us, purge us, deliver us, save us. Put us on the right track so that none of us are among those who are shocked in that last day to find out that you just don't know us at all. 
Lord, it's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.